Hello everyone, I'm Sarxos and this is Victoria 2 World Conquest Explained. Last year I finished a World Conquest attempt as Germany and in this video I will be explaining all the essential tricks and strategies that make such a run possible. The video is primarily aimed at people who are already well familiar with the basic mechanics of the game, so I'll mostly focus on the stuff that is specifically related to World Conquests. Furthermore, it's based on Vanilla Heart of Darkness version 3.04, without mods. Some of the things I'll be talking about might be universally applicable, but overall, doing a World Conquest with any major mod would probably be a very different experience. Anyway, let's get into it. Part 0. Some background. When Victoria 2 was originally released, before any expansions, conquering the world was actually a much simpler task than it is now. The main reason is that you didn't need to have a Casus Belli to declare wars, making it possible to fight as many wars as you could handle at any time and also cruise break whenever necessary. With expansions however, no CV wars were removed and replaced by the war justification mechanic, which slowed down the rate of expansion considerably. Despite this, there were some ambitious players out there who had tried their hand at completing a world conquest under the new restrictions, notably Gurren275 who is responsible for discovering some of the most broken exploits later used in World Conquest runs. But ultimately, these efforts weren't enough to finish the job at the time, and completing a full World Conquest using both expansions was widely believed to be literally impossible. But this belief was eventually proven wrong in September of 2015, when the player Equal Space pulled off the first complete World Conquest using both expansions. It was done as the United Kingdom and was documented through a Reddit post where Equal Space explained their strategy in detail along with a few screenshots. But then, almost two years later, in May of 2017, Equal Space's groundbreaking achievement would be one-upped by something even crazier, as a player known as Dervas completed the World Conquest at Greece. This was extensively documented through their legendary AAR series titled Heaven Cannot Brook Two Sons Nor Earth Two Masters which showcased the campaign in far more detail than Equal Space had done for theirs, complete with tons of screenshots and accompanying text. I can't overstate the extreme level of game knowledge on display here, and in fact Derva's AAR taught me several valuable lessons that I could apply in my own attempt later. To the best of my knowledge, these were the only complete world conquests done in unmodded Victoria 2, but they weren't the only ones that have been attempted. If you look back at Equal Space's old Reddit thread from 2015, you might notice some comments by a Reddit user named M Chainsaw, talking about the World Conquest attempt they had been working on at the time. This user is none other than me, and yes, that is still the username I go by on Reddit because reasons. So I have in fact been interested in this challenge since before anyone had actually pulled it off, and during the summer of 2021, I finally got myself together and went through with it, completing the third ever total World Conquest in Week 2 using the expansions and the first to be fully recorded in video form. But I think that's enough background information, let's get into the World Conquest itself. Part 1. Why Victoria 2 World Conquests are so difficult In vanilla Victoria 2 there are exactly 2703 provinces in the world, contained within 550 states. Some of these start as unclaimed territories that can be acquired for colonization, and depending on which country you play as, there are some territories that can be integrated diplomatically, such as most of Central Europe in the case of Germany. But for the vast majority of the world, there's only one way to obtain new lands. War. The main thing that makes World Conquest in Week 2 so difficult compared to most other Paradox games is that there are a lot of restrictions that limit how fast you can expand through war, which combined with a relatively short 100 year time frame makes it very hard to conquer everything before the end of the game. The first restriction is that you can't declare war without the valid Casus Belli. As I mentioned earlier, no CB wars were removed from the game with expansions. The second restriction is that the only universally reliable way to get a Casus Belli is to justify war goals, a process which can take anything from a few months to several years, depending on the circumstances. The third restriction is that you can't freely add additional war goals during an ongoing war unless specific conditions are met which means you can normally only enforce one war goal for every war you fight. By default, each war goal would only let you conquer one single state, though there are exceptions to this rule, which I will be talking more about later. So, 
To fight each war, you'll usually have to spend around 6 to 12 months justifying a war goal, which means that by a reasonable estimate, you might have time to declare around 100 to 150 wars before the end of the game. Most wars only let you conquer one state. To complete the challenge, you'll have to conquer hundreds of states. Not to mention that there are some large nations, such as Russia, that would require dozens of wars to conquer, which makes things like truce timers a problem as well. The takeaway here is that, when playing the game as intended, expansion through war is simply too slow for a world conquest to be possible before the end date. But as luck would have it, there is one specific mechanic in this game which holds the key to unlocking rapid expansion, and is thus the single most essential ingredient to a successful world conquest. Which brings us to... Part 2. Revanchism and Jingoism Like I said earlier, you can't freely add additional war goals during an ongoing war unless specific conditions are met. There are three such conditions. First, you can always add any war goal that you already had before the start of the war. For example, if you have multiple reconquest war goals on different states. Second, if you get into a great war after they've been unlocked, you can freely add as many war goals as you like. But if neither of these conditions apply, the only time you can add war goals is when your population has an average support of jingoism at 7% or above. A big problem with that is that every time you add a war goal, you will instantly lose a significant chunk of jingoism and will have to wait for it to go up again. This applies even to war goals that don't themselves require jingoism to be added, including the very first war goal you add when you declare a war. Under normal circumstances, jingoism increases very slowly which means that it can take years for it to reach back up to 7% after a war goal has been added. There are a few ways to get one-time boosts of jingoism, such as through certain election events, but that's too inconsistent to be relied upon long-term. Fortunately, there's also another mechanic that is much more consistent. Revanchism. Revanchism is gained when other countries own provinces that you have cores on. I don't know the exact formula, but it's related to the proportion of cores that are owned by you versus cores that are owned by other countries, and cores and provinces that have a majority of your primary culture are worth more in this regard. So to get high revanchism, you want other countries to own a large amount of your cores, and you want your own country to own as few of your own cores as possible. The main benefit of revanchism is that it increases your jingoism growth. Between 1 and 5% revanchism, Jingoism growth increases by 10% for every 1% revanchism. Then it increases by another 10% at 10% revanchism. But the big payoff comes when your revanchism hits 15 and 20%. At 15% you get a 300% increase in jingoism. And at 20% you get a whopping 700% increase. Oh, and did I mention these modifiers are additive? Because these modifiers are additive, baby! So to really make sure you never have to worry about jingoism again, try to get your revanchism about 20% for a total jingoism bonus of 1050%. So, how do you get your revanchism that high? Well, there are several ways to do it, and different countries have different opportunities. The simplest way is to play as a country that already has lots of cores on other countries. This was the method used by Dervas in their Greek world conquest, since Greece starts with lots of cores on the Ottomans. Another method is to provoke separatist rebels within your core territory and let them gain independence. This method was used by Equal Space in their British world conquest, as they allowed Irish rebels to gain independence. Yet another method is to intentionally lose a war and let other countries conquer your cores from you. Do note, however, that if you release a nation as a vassal from your own territory, or if another country forces you to release a nation via the Free People or Liberate Country war goals, then all the cores you had on that territory will be removed. While this isn't ideal, it actually can be useful. If you already have at least some cores on other countries, then removing cores that you own will effectively increase the proportion of cores that you don't own, thus increasing your revanchism that way. The method I used in my own world conquest as Germany is one that is unique to formable nations. While still playing as Prussia, I released Poland and Lithuania as vassals. This, of course, removed all Prussian cores from the territories, but Germany also has cores on those territories, and since I hadn't formed Germany yet, those cores remained intact. When I later did form Germany, I integrated most of the German miners, but since neither Poland nor Lithuania are German, they didn't get integrated. Thus, the German cores on their land would now generate revanchism for me along with the cores in Schleswig held by Denmark and a few others. Despite this, my revanchism only reached 
so to further increase it, I re-released most of the German miners I had integrated earlier, to remove my cores from their territory. With this, I managed to get my revanchism as high as 21%, and since Germany is a cultural union, I'm able to reintegrate any German nation diplomatically simply by sphering them and waiting for a certain event to fire, so there's no need to reconquer them for war. Getting your revanchism about 20% is ideal, but even if you only manage to get it at 15%, it can still work, but then you might have to take some other things into consideration, such as reform desire, but I'll talk more about that in a later section of the video. Another thing to be wary of is that your revanchism might fluctuate even if your number of cores doesn't change. This is because cores on provinces that have a majority of your primary and possibly also accepted cultures affect revanchism more than provinces without such a majority. And since the cultural makeup of a province can change over time due to assimilation or migration, you can cause the revanchism generated by the province to change as well. I myself had some problems with this in the late game, as my revanchism gradually dropped from 21% to 19%. There is another little trick to making the most of your jingoism that is worth mentioning. As explained earlier, when you add a war goal, your jingoism temporarily drops by a few percent, which likely means you'll have to wait a while before you can add another. But as it turns out, the game doesn't actually check if your jingoism has dropped until one in-game day has passed. This means that once you have at least 7% jingoism, you can add multiple war goals on different countries at once, as long as you don't unpause the game. Just make sure you have enough diplo points stored up. This trick can be very useful to get your war goals added quicker whenever you're at war with multiple countries at the same time. One more important thing to mention on this topic is the technology, nationalism and imperialism. It's a very useful tech in a normal game, but in a world conquest you will most likely want to avoid it for the entire game. The reason is that this technology unlocks the generic coring event, which can randomly give you new cores on provinces that either have accepted culture pops or neighbors one of your other cores. This would quickly cause your revanchism to plummet, which is why it's best not to research that tech at all. You can still make it work even if you do research it though but it requires a lot of careful management of borders and pops to avoid too many cores. This was demonstrated by Dervas in their Greece World Conquest, where they opted to research nationalism and imperialism for the 10% bonus war justification speed and also to get a higher diplo point modifier later. Which brings us to the next part of the video. Part 3. War Justifications and Diplo Points While Jingoism lets you add more war goals in an ongoing war, it still doesn't let you start new wars without already having a valid Cassus Belly. For the most part, new CBs can only be acquired through war justification, and as mentioned earlier, the number of justifications you'll have time for during a campaign is limited, so you'll want to make the most out of the justifications you have. Another important thing to consider are diplo points. Justifying war, declaring wars, and adding war goals are all actions that cost diplo points. Diplo points are regained passively at a relatively slow rate each month. So to conquer the world efficiently, you'll also want to minimize the number of diplo points you spend. Optimizing the use of war justifications and minimizing the use of diplo points often go hand in hand. So let's talk about various ways to deal with both of these things. One important consideration, especially against large countries, is to take as many war goals as possible in each war. This means demanding as close to 100% worth of war score as you can, and if you're facing multiple enemies in one war, you want to piece out each of them separately. Each war goal costs one diplo point to add, but declaring a new war effectively costs one extra diplo point, since you also have to spend one when you start justifying your initial war goal. The more war goals you take per war, the fewer wars you'll have to fight in total, which means you spend fewer diplo points and also spend less time on justifications. For the same reason, it's good to try to fight as many countries as possible in each war. One way of doing so is of course to attack someone that has allies. In the early game, the AI will usually honor their alliances, but as you become more and more powerful, the AI will be less likely to honor call to arms. In my experience though, great powers are less likely to abandon their allies even in the late game, especially if their armies are in good shape but the most reliable allies are countries that are both sphered by and allied to a great power. If you attack their sphere leader, these countries tend to honor the alliance pretty much 100% of the time. When it comes to countries that have puppets or substates, there's another trick that can allow you to annex all of the puppets in one war. 
Puppets will automatically join their overlord when you declare on them, but you can't add conquest war goals on puppets directly. However, if they become independent during the war, they will count as a regular ally and you can then add war goals on them as normal. One reliable way to make this happen is to fully occupy the overlord and or the puppets, then let the war drag out to drive up their war exhaustion. This will in turn increase their militancy until eventually a rebellion is triggered. If this rebellion consists of ideological rebels, for example reactionaries, communists, etc, and they manage to break the country by occupying the capital for a month, then that will cause puppets to become independent. If the rebels enforce their demands in a puppet state, then only that puppet state will become independent. But if they enforce their demands in the overlord, then all their puppets will become independent. By forcing the puppets to become independent during war with the overlord, you can conquer every one of them during that same war, rather than having to justify and declare war on every puppet state individually, something which would have wasted both time and diplo points. This trick is especially useful against the UK with all their Indian puppets, and China with all of their substates. Another way to save diplo points has to do with peace deals. Normally, sending a peace offer costs one diplo point, but if you have a full 100% war score on your opponent, sending a peace offer actually doesn't cost any diplo points, but you still need to have one in store or else the button will be greyed out. Similarly, if your opponent sends you a peace offer, it won't cost you anything to accept it, so try to end every war in one of these two ways if possible. In most cases, saving time and war justifications also saves diplo points, but sometimes it can be useful to sacrifice some diplo points in order to cut down on justification time. This has to do with the fact that most war goals have a base justification time of 200 days, but both Acquire State and Conquest have a base time of 400 days. So although the latter two are the ones you'll typically need in order to conquer territory, it's actually faster to justify some other war goal initially, for example Humiliate, then add the war goals you actually want during the war using Yinguism. The downside of this is that it wastes an additional diplo point, since you'll be spending one to add a war goal which you don't actually need. When to prioritize faster justifications mostly depends on whether you're currently low on diplo points. If you've been adding so many war goals that you're constantly having to wait for diplo points to replenish, then it's better to wait for the longer justifications. But if you're close to the diplo point cap, then you might as well go with the faster justifications, since any diplo points you earn while you're at the cap will be wasted anyway. While war justification is the only consistent way to obtain war goals, there are a number of random events that can give you war goals as well. These are usually not for conquering territory, but they can still be very useful, because they provide a diplo point neutral way to skip the war justification time altogether. That's because, even though you waste a diplo point by adding a useless war goal, you save a diplo point by not having to justify that war goal in the first place. So you spend the same amount of diplo points, but can skip the entire justification time. If you happen to have cores on a country you want to fight, you can also use the Retake Cores cost spelly, which is permanently available to achieve the same effect. For example, I used this frequently in my run to declare war on Scandinavia, since I had cores on Schleswig, but I made sure not to actually enforce that war goal until the end, since I wanted Scandinavia to keep those cores for the sake of my ranchism as well as the free castles belly. Another semi-reliable way to get free CBs is to invest in small civilized countries by building factories, if the government allows foreign investments that is, and then hope that they fall to a communist uprising later. When communists gain power by force, they will automatically perform nationalization, i.e. seize all your investments for themselves, which in turn gives you a free make puppet CB on that country. Keep in mind though that the puppet CB is only valid for countries that consist of three states or fewer. If a larger country falls to communists, you still get a pop-up saying you got the CB, but it will instantly disappear again. Now, let's talk about what is perhaps the coolest exploit in the whole game and one which is incredibly useful in world conquests. The Liberation Conquest Exploit. This is an exploit that can allow you to conquer huge swaths of territory in one go, much more than you normally could. To demonstrate how it works, let's take a look at a classic example, conquering Poland-Lithuania from Russia. Here's how to do it. First, you use the Free People War Goal to release Poland-Lithuania as a single state country. Then, you declare war on Poland-Lithuania with a Conquest War Goal and at the same time you declare war on Russia with a liberate country war goal. 
Once you've beaten both of your enemies to the point where they would accept your peace deals, you first make peace with Russia to release all cores of Poland-Lithuania. Then immediately after, you make peace with Poland-Lithuania to annex them. Congratulations! You've just conquered all the core territory of Poland-Lithuania at once. So, why does this work? Well, the conquest war goal can only be justified on a civilized country if it has but one single state remaining. But if you already declared war using that causes belly, it will remain valid even if the target country grows to a larger size during the war. The most reliable way this can be exploited is like the example above, using the liberate country war goal to release the target country's course from another nation. This not only lets you conquer multiple states with one war goal, but it also lets you conquer more than 100% worth of war score in a single war, since the liberate country war goal is always capped at 100 even if the total cost of the territory exceeds it. Here are some examples of other places where I used this exploit during my run. Release and conquer Greece, Serbia and Egypt from the Ottomans, India, Canada and Australia from the UK, Sweden from Scandinavia and Mexico from the USA. Another benefit of this exploit is that it can make the rest of the country's territory cheaper to conquer. The reason is that the war score cost for states is affected by their value relative to the total war score value of the whole country. In other words, conquering a state from a large country like Russia is generally cheaper than conquering a state from a small country like Belgium, because that one state makes up a much smaller portion of Russia's total size. When you conquer a country like Russia, the war score cost of their states will gradually go up with each war as their country shrinks, so you can't take as many states at once. But as mentioned earlier, the cost of the liberate country war goal is capped at 100, so no matter how small Russia becomes, you'll always be able to release all of Poland-Lithuania from them in one war. This can be exploited by waiting to conquer the Polish-Lithuanian cores for as long as possible, because as long as Russia owns them, all of their other states will be cheaper to take. In my run, I used this trick to great effect versus Russia, the UK and the Ottomans, allowing me to conquer them in fewer wars than I otherwise could have. There's one more major point to talk about on the topic of diplopoints and war justification, namely uncivilized countries. Uncivs are faster and more efficient to conquer for several reasons. One is of course that they're generally much weaker than civilized countries. But the main thing is that any unciv with four states or fewer can always be annexed with a single war goal, unlike civilized countries where they have to be down to one state. For that reason, it's very important to conquer any unciv that has more than one state before they westernize, or else you'll be wasting more diplo points and justification time than necessary. But even uncivs that only have one state are best to conquer before westernization, because then they can be conquered via the established protectorate war goal which is one of the fastest war goals to justify, rather than the usual conquest war goal, which is one of the slowest. So all in all, you don't want to wait too long to conquer the uncivs, particularly the ones that have more than four states, since they will require more than one war to fully conquer. Of particular note are countries like China, Japan and Persia, especially the latter two, since they tend to westernize relatively quickly. But while you don't want to wait too long to conquer most uncivs, you also don't want to conquer them too early. This will be explained more as we move on to Part 4 Colonization A proper world conquest requires you to own every province on the map, and that of course includes those provinces that start the game uncolonized. To gain ownership of these provinces, you can either colonize them yourself directly, or let another nation colonize them and then conquer them through war. Naturally, the first option is the preferable one whenever it's possible, because any state you have to take through war is going to cost you a diplo point, while colonizing a state does not. There are some states that start the game entirely uncolonized, while some states are split between uncolonized provinces and provinces owned by one or more nations. In the latter case, you can't avoid having to spend a diplo point whether you colonize the unclaimed part of the state or not, but doing so is still worthwhile, since it will make the part you have to conquer through war cheaper to demand in a peace deal. So either way, it's worth it to try and colonize as much as you can. There are several things to keep in mind to be successful at colonization. First, technology. To colonize a given state, it needs to have a life rating at or above your country's minimum life rating. In the beginning, the minimum life rating is 35, which only allows colonizing a small number of states, most of them in North America, but also a few in Southeast Africa as well as Sakhalin Island. 
Only a select few countries will have the colonial range to grab these, however. The medicine technology, which is available to be researched right at the start, has an invention that lowers minimum life rating by 5, unlocking a few provinces in the African interior, as well as South Georgia, the Sunda Islands and Turkmenia. State and government has the invention Mission to Civilize, that can lower it by another 10, giving access to a few more states in Africa, a few in Central Asia and a couple of Asian islands. To have a chance to unlock this invention, you'll also need to research at least one out of market regulations, naval statistics or nationalism and imperialism, all of which become available in 1850. Finally, breech-loaded rifles has the invention Colonial Negotiations, which lowers minimum life rating by another 10 and unlocks all remaining uncolonized land. To unlock this invention, you additionally have to research either machine guns, economic responsibility or naval logistics all of which become available in 1870. This final batch of uncolonized land is by far the largest, so that's the most important technology deadline to meet. To maximize your chances of colonizing everything before the AI, you want to unlock these technologies and inventions as soon as possible. Medicine is a great first technology to research overall, since it has a lot of useful effects, such as bonus pop growth and military hospitals. As for the other two, the relevant inventions are effectively gated at the years 1850 and 1870 respectively, so there's no hurry to research the technologies themselves as long as you have them ready before those dates. But for the additional technologies that allow unlocking the inventions, it's likely worth it to try and save up research points during the year preceding their unlock date. In case you don't know, whenever you're not currently researching anything, you're able to store all the research points you generate for up to a year which can then be spent to research the next technology at a much faster pace. This is useful for researching particularly important technologies that unlock at a certain date, for example the ones required for colonization. Thus, if possible, I'd recommend you avoid researching anything during the years 1849 and 1869, so you can save up extra research points and get a head start on colonization. In addition to technology, in order to colonize a given region, it also has to be within your colonial range. Increasing your colonial reach can be done in two ways. First, you can always reach any state that is directly adjacent to land owned either by you or one of your puppets. This is the only way to reach inland areas. The second way is for naval bases, which project your colonial range to coastal areas within the reach. You can build one naval base in each region you own, and higher level naval bases have a greater reach than lower level ones. Before the colonial technologies become available, you want to make sure you have colonial reach to as many uncolonized territories as possible. The ones with life rating 35 are in practice restricted to the countries that can already reach them at the start of the game, while the ones with life rating 30 may be reachable by anyone if they're quick enough, but getting to all of them in time can be challenging. You'll have more time to prepare for the rest of them, however. The first priority is to get the regions that become available around 1850. Before then, you'll want to get at least a few coastal provinces around East Asia and put down some naval bases, in order to reach the few islands in the area that have life rating 20. The second region of interest is Central Asia, where the best option is to take one state from Persia and two from Russia, so that you get land borders to all the uncolonized land there. Then you'll be in position to secure all uncolonized land that gets unlocked in 1850. But of course, the big haul happens in 1870, when most of Africa and the Pacific Islands become available. For Africa, the most important thing is to make sure that all of the coasts are within reach. You don't actually need very much land to accomplish this. If you take one or two European colonies on the west coast and a piece of Oman's colonies on the east coast, then upgrade to level 3 naval bases, you should be good. However, it can also be worth it to grab a piece of Sokoto and maybe Egypt as well, just to have earlier access to the interior. For the Pacific, I'd recommend grabbing Guam from Spain, Hawaii and maybe a piece of New Zealand, which should let you reach basically everything with level 3 naval bases. Lastly, to reach most of the uncolonized areas in northern Siberia, you need to grab a few states from Russia. Now, in order to colonize, you need to invest colonial power. It costs 80 power to begin colonizing an area, and if no other nation contests it, you can create a protectorate after 270 days. If another nation does contest it, however, you'll have to invest more power every 90 days to maintain your presence in the region. 
This cost is initially fairly low, but the longer the conflict drags on, the more expensive each successive investment becomes. This goes on until one of the contenders gives up, or the tension triggers a colonial crisis. Whether someone contests you or not, as soon as you manage to establish a protectorate, all the colonial power you invested in the colony is returned to you, so these are only temporary expenditures. To ensure you have enough power to secure everything, you're gonna have to dedicate much of the early game to building up your colonial capacity. Colonial power is gained from two sources, naval bases and ships. Naval bases provide a base amount of 30 power, plus 20 power for each additional level of the naval base but only if they are built either in one of your core provinces or in a province that has a direct land connection to your capital. For that reason, it can be worth it to try to prioritize expanding along the coast from your capital in the early game, so that you can build more power generating naval bases. But even naval bases that don't directly generate power can still be useful, since they increase your naval capacity. The second way to gain colonial power is through ships, which generate different amounts of power depending on the ship type but only as long as you don't exceed your naval capacity. For the early colonization, it can be worth it to spam mana wars to give you a bit of an extra boost, but when it comes to the major scramble in 1870, you want to be building ironclads. Ironclads is the ship type with the most efficient colonial power to supply cost ratio in the game, generating 4 power per unit of supply, but they can only be built in level 3 naval bases on your home continent. That's another reason it's important to expand your coastline around your capital in the early game. To build all of these things, you'll require some additional technologies. The Naval Doctrine line of techs unlock higher naval base levels, and the tech for level 3 naval bases becomes available in 1855. To unlock ironclads, you need the Iron Steamers technology, which becomes available in 1860. While it might seem like you have plenty of time to research these, you should still try to get them as soon as you can, since constructing naval bases and ships takes a lot of time and you'll want as many of both as possible before 1870. It's also a good idea to research the steamers technology, which is a precursor to iron steamers, relatively early, to unlock steamer factories, so you can make sure to have plenty of steamer production for when you need to build them en masse. Besides gaining more colonial power, it's also important to avoid tying up too much of it in colonial maintenance. Every colonial state you own ties up a bit of colonial power, thus reducing the amount you have to spend on new colonies. Colonial states are gained when you colonize, but also when you conquer colonies from other nations or take territory from uncivilized countries. That's why you should avoid conquering too many uncivs before colonization is finished. But as mentioned earlier, you'll probably want to begin shipping away at Japan and Persia in particular, since they both require several wars to annex and tend to westernize quickly. There are also some instances where taking colonies from other civilized countries may be worth it, most notably the USA. Most of their western regions start the game as colonial states, but they will inevitably be upgraded to full states before too long. Colonial states are generally significantly cheaper in war score compared to full states, so grabbing them early means you'll need fewer wars in total to conquer the USA. Fortunately for you though, the colonial maintenance mechanic can also be taken advantage of to sabotage the colonial efforts of your AI competitors, especially the UK. The Brits have huge colonial potential, but at the start of the game most of their colonial power is tied up in large colonies in Canada, Australia, India and South Africa. If left alone, the UK will usually release most of these as dominions later in the game, which frees up loads of colonial power for them. But, due to how the game works, they can't release a country from their own territory if it already exists on the map. This can be exploited by using the Free People CB to force them to release Canada, Australia, India and South Africa as single state nations, robbing them of the ability to release the rest of those territories. This is especially convenient since all of these are viable targets for the Liberation Conquest exploit later in the game, so you don't even waste time or diplo points in this maneuver. This typically cripples the UK's colonial capacity to the point where they will barely be an obstacle. As for any other potential competitors, such as France, Spain or USA, you can simply try to conquer as much of their coastlines as possible and steal the smaller colonies they have around the world to reduce their reach. Now, once the colonial scramble of 1870 gets going, your first priority should be to cover all of the coastal areas or other regions that potential competitors can reach. 
Once you've managed to block off all of these areas, you can take as much time as you want to finish up the interiors. The AI tends to focus all of their attention on at most two to three colonies at a time, so if you end up being contested somewhere, you can just keep the AI busy in those places while you grab everything else. Remember to keep building ships on naval bases even after colonization begins, because it will likely take several years to secure what you need, and you might end up needing every little bit of colonial power that you can get. That's basically everything I have to say about colonization. So, on to the next part of the video. Part 5. Dealing with Truces Even with all the tricks we talked about to speed up conquest, truces can still be a problem. This applies in particular to the larger countries like Russia or the USA. When peace is signed, a 5 year truce goes into effect. Having to wait over 5 years between every war might make conquering the larger countries before the end of the game a bit tight. So what are the ways to get around this? Well, sometimes you can circumvent the truce by attacking an ally of the country you have the truce with, in hopes that they get called in, but this is not always an option. Another option is if you end up on different sides of a crisis war, but that's also very unreliable. Besides, crisis wars are not very efficient for rapid conquest since you can't sign separate peace deals during them. There is however one circumstance where a truce may be lifted prematurely, namely if the target country falls to a rebellion. This will immediately let you begin justifying war goals and declare war on them again, even if you just recently signed a peace deal. Note however that the truce is only lifted one way. If another country falls to a rebellion, then you're free to attack them, but they're not free to attack you. If you're the one who falls to a rebellion, then the opposite happens. Because of this, it can sometimes be worth it to drag a war out for longer than needed, just to increase your opponent's war exhaustion and militancy until they have an uprising. As I mentioned earlier, rebels need to occupy the capital province for a month to break the country, so to be on the safe side you can keep the war going until you're certain that the rebels will be able to take the capital. Then you simply wait until they're done and you can get right back to planning the next war. Beware though that the AI can often stave off rebellions for quite some time by continuously passing reforms, which temporarily reduces their militancy. For this reason, forcing rebellions is more reliable against countries that have already passed the most possible reforms. You can view the ledger to find out how many reforms they've already passed, or whose government form doesn't allow them to pass reforms at all. This includes uncivilized nations, bourgeois dictatorships, and to a limited extent proletariat dictatorships. With any luck, the aforementioned trick should be enough, but if all else fails, there's one more option to consider. Truce breaking. In Vic 2, you can only truce break if you have a valid casus belli against the target, but the issue is that you can't justify war goals against someone you have a truce with. For that reason, the only countries you can reliably break truces with are those you have a permanent war goal on, such as retake cores. This is something I used near the end of my world conquest against France, since they owned Alsace-Lorraine which I had cores on, allowing me to declare multiple consecutive wars against them as long as I didn't annex my cores. If you don't have any permanent war goals, you can sometimes get lucky with a random war goal from an event, but that's obviously not something you can count on. There is, however, one semi reliable way to truce break a country even if you don't have cores on them. When you finish justifying a war goal, it remains valid for exactly one year before it expires. If you have a party with jingoism or pro military as their war policy, you should be able to justify three different war goals in a row against the same country before the first one expires. What you can then do is declare war using the first war goal but avoid adding any of the other two. Then make sure to finish that war before the second war goal expires. You can then immediately truce break using the second war goal and then finally repeat the process a third time using the third war goal. This means you can effectively fight up to three wars in a row against the same target if you're quick enough. This is something I made use of against Russia and the USA near the end of my campaign, in order to conquer the last few states they had before I ran out of time. Or rather, I would have been able to use it to conquer the last few states, but I forgot one crucial fact. The Humiliate War goal becomes invalid if you won a war against a country within the last 5 years. So if you want to use it as one of the 3 war goals for truce breaking, you have to make sure it's the first one, because otherwise it will disappear after you win the first war. This is something I forgot about when I wanted to truce break Russia, which indirectly led to me not being able to finish them off before the end of the game. 
Ultimately, I had to resort to save scumming to correct that mistake and finish the world conquest. Anyway, while truth breaking can be used as a last resort, it's best to avoid it if possible due to the penalties you get. Specifically, every truth break incurs 2 infamy, minus 100 prestige, and 4 militancy across all pops. The infamy and the prestige loss are completely irrelevant in the late game, since you'll be drowning in both anyway, but the militancy is a bit worse. Which brings us to... Part 6. Militancy and Rebellions. If you play this game for any period of time, you might be familiar with its alternate title, Rebel Simulator 2. Even in a regular campaign, late game rebellions can be absolutely massive and relentless. So just imagine that, but on a literally global scale, and you'll probably understand why it's important to know how to deal with it. In the early game, large rebellions can throw a big wrench in your plans. They're rarely a threat in and of themselves, but they can tie up large portions of your armies and wear down your soldier pops. If this happens right when you're about to fight a big war, it can seriously hamper your progress. As the game goes on, your country becomes ever more powerful and your enemies become ever weaker. So rebellions are less likely to directly interfere with your wars. But you better keep an eye on your capital, because if just a single rebel stack manages to occupy it for a single month, it'll break your country. Something which can be desirable sometimes, but under the wrong circumstances it can be rather devastating. Case in point, during my World Conquest run, I once let my capital fall to anarcho-liberals, which turned me into a bourgeois dictatorship. My economy and industries took a major hit from the mandatory laissez-faire policy, but the worst part was that the rebels rolled back most of my political reforms and refused to enact any new ones. If you remember back to the part about jingoism, I briefly mentioned that reform desire can be a problem if your revanchism falls below 20%. That's because when a pop wants a certain reform, it competes with their interests for all other issues, including jingoism. So if your pops desire a lot of reforms but aren't getting them, it will significantly slow down your jingoism growth. If you're about 20% revanchism, it's usually fine anyway, but the bonus for 15% revanchism sometimes isn't quite enough on its own. It just so happened that when the anarcho-liberals seized power, I just dropped down to 19% revanchism, and due to my pop's desire for all the reforms that the government refused to enact, I had trouble consistently keeping jingoism high enough to add war gods. The issue was eventually solved when I had a Jacobin uprising that I intentionally allowed to win, which turned me into a democracy and allowed me to pass reforms once again. So as a rule of thumb, if you can't get your revanchism about 20%, you'll want to avoid getting stuck with a government form that doesn't allow passing reforms, or if you do, you'll want to switch government form again as soon as possible, likely by allowing the right type of rebellion to succeed. The main government forms to avoid are bourgeois dictatorships, caused by anarcho-liberal rebels, and to a lesser extent proletariat dictatorships, caused by communist rebels. Democracies enforced by Jacobins or fascist dictatorships enforced by fascist rebels are both able to pass reforms freely, however. I should also briefly mention nationalist rebels. These are usually not a big problem, since their uprisings will be limited in size. But if they enforce their demands, they will of course lose some amount of territory to the new nation. Fortunately, to enforce their demands, they need to occupy every single one of their country's core provinces for a month, so they're quite easy to deal with as long as you have any kind of army nearby. Ironically, the more problematic nationalists are those of smaller countries, since they have fewer provinces they need to occupy. Of particular note is the one province minor Manhattan Commune, whose only core is on the province of New York, so watch out for that one. Finally, there is one more big reason why late game rebellions are a problem, and it's one I had severely underestimated myself when I went into this challenge. Lag. Like, a lot of lag. When most of the world is under your boot, you may end up with literally tens of millions of rebels rising up at the same time. I have a pretty decent computer that can usually run late game Vic 2 quite fine, but once these large scale rebellions get going, the game turns into an absolute slog. Here's a real time clip from one such event during my run. Okay. Yep. The game's just frozen right now. Hello. Hello, game. Hmm. 
Hmm. Yeah, I wasn't kidding. This became so unbearable at times that I seriously considered giving up the run. If the rebellion isn't too large, you can sometimes power through it if you have a huge number of armies solely dedicated to rebel hunting, since the more rebels you wipe, the less severe the lag. But sometimes you get such ridiculously large rebellions that there's only one viable way out. Let them win, as quickly as possible. Typically there will always be a big stack of rebels to spawn on your capital, so all you have to do is leave them alone until they occupy it, then wait one month until they enforce their demands. Once they do, all rebels of their faction will instantly disappear and you'll also lose a big chunk of militancy. Even this relatively short wait can be absolute torture, but it's honestly the only way to handle it without resorting to sheets. Of course, ideally you'd want to avoid rebel uprisings as much as possible, so let's talk about some ways to minimize that risk. I'll say up front I'm not at all an expert in managing militancy, but I do know of one consistent way to keep it down. Passing reforms. Every time you pass a reform, militancy drops by a significant amount, but typically only temporarily. Since the number of reforms you can pass in total is limited, being conservative with them and spreading them out as much as possible can be a crucial way to avoid rebellions for much of the game. Rather than passing a reform every time you can, try to keep an eye on the rebel tab and see if there are any significant rebel groups that have a significant chance of an uprising. If there's a rebel group you really don't want rising up that has a risk of doing so, then that would be a good time to pass a reform. If no rebel group has an actual revolt risk, then it's better to hold on to your reforms, even if militancy in general is high. This is another reason why becoming a communist or an anarcho-liberal dictatorship can spell trouble. You probably won't be able to pass any more reforms to keep further rebellions at bay. Alright, I actually think that's most of the major topics I wanted to talk about. There are a few more things that are worth mentioning, but they're not big enough to warrant an entire video part of their own. As such, we'll now move on to... Part 7. Various smaller topics. Starting with... Part 7a. Warfare. Obviously, the art of war is incredibly important in a world conquest, but most aspects of fighting wars efficiently are not unique to this challenge, and have already been covered in great detail by other people. Therefore, I won't go into too much detail here, and instead focus on a few things I think are particularly relevant to conquering the world. I might consider making a standalone video where I talk about this topic more extensively, if people are interested. So let me know in the comments if that's something you'd like. Anyway, here are a few tips. Manage your generals. Having generals with high attack stats for offensive battles and high defense stats for defensive battles can make a huge difference. Even though it may be tedious to constantly move generals around just to make sure any important battle is properly led, it's worth it in the long run. Focus more on battles and less on occupations in the early to mid game, since they're a very efficient way to get war score and you'll have a much easier time occupying your enemy once most of their army is gone. Keep in mind though that battle war score is capped at 50 and only applies to the war leader, so any secondary participants will have to be occupied if you want to piece them out separately. Later on, when you have enough armies and strategic territories, wars against large civilized countries can be won much more efficiently by rushing to occupy mobilization centers ASAP. Each state has one province that serves as a mobilization center, and it's where all mobilized troops from that state will spawn. It can be identified through the recruitment map mode, or through a small factory building on the map if you zoom in, but only if the province is not covered by fog of war. By placing an army on one of these provinces, you can get favorable defensive battles against any troops they mobilize, and once you occupy them, they can't spawn any more troops at all. This will greatly reduce the amount of troops the enemy can muster. I should also mention that, while most countries will gradually become weaker over the course of the game as you keep stealing their land, any new world nation that is eligible to receive immigrants is likely to have the opposite development. This applies especially to the United States, but watch out for the Latin American countries too. As an example, here you can see the single state nation of Colombia mobilizing literally hundreds of thousands of soldiers on top of their already impressive standing army. This shouldn't be a serious threat to you by any means, but it might require you to prepare more carefully than usual if you want to win efficiently. Part 7b. Industry. Once you pass the early game, making money probably won't be an issue it is still important to set up your industries right and know what to prioritize. In particular, you need military goods to keep your massive army supplied. 
artillery, small arms, ammunition, canned food, as well as intermediary products like fertilizer, explosives and steel are all important to produce a lot of. In my run I had portions of the mid game where I ran into serious shortages of canned food in particular, which makes sense since it's used a lot by infantry, which take the bulk of the damage and need reinforcements the most. But artillery can also become tight due to its expense and complex production line. Overall, try to set up a lot of the important factories early, then use national focuses for craftsmen and factory priority to get more production of the goods you may lack. It can also be a good idea to use manual stockpiles and max out the important goods, so that you have a lot in storage for when you might need it. Part 7c Infamy Some of you might be surprised that I haven't talked about this until now. But that's because you'll spend the vast majority of the campaign so far above the infamy limit that it really just becomes a number. But it can be worth thinking about right in the early game, particularly in regards to your timing for going above the limit. Once you do, chances are good most strong countries in the world will try to dogpile you. But they can only do so if you don't have a truce and they aren't already involved in a war with you, whether as an enemy or an ally. This can be taken advantage of by getting truces with different great powers at different times before you go about the limit, so that you only need to fight a few of them at a time and can effectively cycle through them for a while. In my game as Germany I got early truces with France, Russia and Spain, but ended at slightly different times, and I had called in the UK into a big war against the US at the time I went about the limit. That ensured I could comfortably prepare for containment wars and mostly fight the great powers one or two at a time. Then once I was past the early game, I was so powerful compared to everyone else that I really didn't have to care about infamy anymore. Of course, Prussia is quite strong at the start, and once you form Greater Germany, you're probably already the strongest nation in the world. If you want to do a world conquest starting as a weaker country, you might have to worry a bit more about infamy than I did, but the general idea of cycling truces between great powers should still be a useful strategy. Part 7D Technology for technology, the areas that matter the most are military, industry, as well as the technologies required for colonization. Staying ahead with military tech is not essential, but can make a life a lot easier for you. Keeping up in industry techs is particularly nice in the first half of the game or so, to help keep up in military goods production. And a special mention goes to the chemistry and electricity tree for its bonuses to the supply limit and attrition reduction. Naval can be almost entirely ignored aside from the texts relevant to colonization. When it comes to culture texts, the philosophy tree can be worth prioritizing, along with the state and government technology in the political thought tree. The psychology tree can be nice too. Commerce texts aren't very important, but are a decent place to dump your research points if you don't have anything better to research. Alright then, I think that covers every general topic I can be bothered to talk about. There are still tons of little things I could mention, but the relevance to world conquest varies, and to keep this video somewhat focused, I gotta stop somewhere. So to round this video off, let me instead provide some inspiration by going over a number of nations that could be good candidates for a world conquest and how to set them up for it. In Part 8 Other World Conquest Viable Countries As of the making of this video, the only three countries that have been used for world conquest are the United Kingdom, Greece and Germany. To get more details on the first two, I'd recommend reading Equalspace's Reddit post for the UK or Derva's AAR for Greece. I will link to both of them in the description. But these three are far from the only viable options. Italy is a country I actually considered myself when I was planning my own world conquest. They can be formed rather quickly as Sardinia Piedmont using Garibaldi rebels. You can check out my Form Italy speedruns if you want to see how. And then once you become a great power, you can take the decision Italia Irredenta, which grants you lots of cores on Austria. This will generate more than enough revanchism, which coupled with Italy's strength and ability to get strong allies in the early game should make for a pretty solid start. The United States can get several cores on Mexico through the Manifest Destiny decision, and while they don't provide as much revanchism as you might like, they should hopefully carry you through the early game. Later on, when the American Civil War breaks out, you can just let the CSA win to get even more revanchism. The US doesn't start out the strongest, but can grow rapidly for immigration, or you can easily pop over to Japan or China for an early population boost. Netherlands starts with plenty of revanchism thanks to the course of Belgium, 
and has a foothold on just about every continent right from the get-go. Early conquests in East Asia should give you the population boon you need to compete in the early game. Sweden has a bit more of a challenging start due to the low population, but they start with decent revanchism thanks to the course of Finland and can amplify that further by releasing Norway as a satellite. They are also tied for the highest starting literacy in the game, letting you get ahead in technology early. If you want an even trickier start, there are a few uncivs that I think could be viable too. China starts with cores on all of their substates, which gives them around 20% revanchism. While I haven't tried it myself, I hear you can westernize fairly quickly as China by intentionally provoking a rebellion to break your country, which sets your substates free and allows you to reconquer some of them for bonus research points. I would probably recommend not conquering too many of them though, to maintain a high revanchism, and instead take some stuff from your neighbors in Korea and Dainam as well. Once westernized, China is a monster, and I doubt you'll have much issue defeating any and all great powers that might come after you. Arabia could be an interesting choice too. They're the quickest to form as Najd, but it's also incredibly weak in that state. So perhaps a better choice is Egypt, which is by far the strongest Arab nation and can westernize reasonably quickly. I'd recommend checking out my Arabia All Core speedrun for inspiration of how to play the early game. But then after forming Arabia, you'll of course want to avoid taking back most of your cores so that you preserve revanchism. Finally, releasing India from the UK and switching to play as them will also leave you with a very strong unsev that has lots of cores on other countries. Once westernized, they should be in a fairly strong position, make them another viable option, I think. There are certainly more viable candidates than these if you look around. The most important factor is the ability to get lots of revanchism quickly. Many countries start with lots of revanchism or can get it through special decisions but even those who don't may be able to get it by allowing separatist rebels to break free or by intentionally losing wars and letting other countries conquer stuff from them. As long as you can get above 15% revanchism, you should be good, but it's possible that it could work with even less than that if you're efficient enough. Starting off powerful is a big plus of course, but any country can become powerful quickly by conquering high pop regions from unsivs, particularly China if you're able to. And now! The part which I'm sure you've all been eagerly waiting for. The end of the video. Thank you so much for watching this wall of text in video form. I hope you found it interesting. I tried to cover the most important aspects of doing a world conquest, but if you have any further questions then don't hesitate to ask, I'm more than happy to answer. The information in this video is a combination of stuff I've figured out myself and stuff I've learned from others. A particular shoutout should go to Dervas for their excellent AAR about the Greece World Conquest. I'd recommend it to anyone looking for some even more in-depth information. If you want to watch the entire journey on my Germany World Conquest from beginning to end, I've got an edited video series here on YouTube of just that. Or if you want to see every single detail, including the many sections of awkward silence as I'm pondering my next move, I have the complete unedited run on my VOD channel. You might also want to check out my custom timeless video I made, which I personally think is pretty cool. All of these things and more will be linked in the description. That's it for me, so have a good time of day!